Hey now everyone, my name is Nick, this is Board Game Brawl, and today, finally, we are going to take a look at Cosmic Encounter. Now, if you've been watching my channel, you've probably seen Cosmic floating around on my shelves back here, moving from spot to spot. So, there's no great mystery here, there's no spoilers. I love the game. If it's in my collection uh, for a long period of time, then I definitely enjoy it to a very large degree. Because games come and go from my collection, only the ones I really, really enjoy or that I haven't gotten around to playing yet, <laughs> seem to stay around for a while. But why exactly do I love the game? Am I just jumping on the bandwagon because a certain other notorious board game reviewer uh, has declared it to be his favorite game of all time? Well, no, actually, it's quite the opposite because back in the day, I bought it based on a lot of people's recommendations, people from my group. This is back when I was just starting to pad out my collection and really getting hardcore into gaming. And honestly, for the first few months that I was into gaming, I wasn't even watching uh, the Dice Tower that much. Yes, that's the board game reviewer that I'm referring to. But this game came really highly recommended from a lot of people on Board Game Geek, from a lot of my friends. And this was at a point where I was trying to get games that uh, other people were recommending to me that had a theme that appealed to me because it was all so new to me. And the first few times I got really, really lucky and bought games that were just awesome. Shadows Over Camelot, Small World, awesome, awesome. I mean, so I was on a roll. So I was like, Cosmic Encounter, seems neat. You got all these alien powers, all these cool little ships. I'm going to give it a shot. Got it, played it the first time, had a horrible experience. It was horrendous. I wanted to flip the table over. I literally wanted to punch somebody because I had such a bad time. The first four or five turns of the game, my, before, you know, before it got around to my turn, I think I was last, my card came out of the deck all three times. All three of my cards came out of the deck. Uh, this won't make any sense to you if you don't know anything about Cosmic Encounter, but all of my cards came out. I was obliterated. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea about trying to form negotiations, but actually it was just a bad game because no one had any incentive to build negotiations about me. Everybody wanted those colonies and they knew that I was new to the game, so they all pounded me. I lost my alien power by losing three planets uh, before it even got to be my turn. And I, and then I just lost horrendously and it was just bad, 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 bad. But I was talked into playing it again mostly by myself just because I was like, oh, I bought this game, so what am I going to do with it? Am I just going to, after one bad game, get rid of it? Ugh, let me try it again. So we played it again, had a little better time. Played it a third time, got a little better. Played it a fourth time, now I get it. Now I understand what I'm supposed to do here. And since then, I've probably played it a total of uh, 17 or 18 times. I'll have to check BGG again, but... I've played it a lot. I actually made it one of the games in my Play 10 Games in 2014 challenge. You can see more about that in one of the videos that I did. And I love it. And in fact, I am actually on a winning streak now, I'm just going to say. I'm not saying I'm the best Cosmic Encounter player in the world. I'm sure I'm one of the worst. But still, among my group, out of the last 10 games that I've played, I think I've won 8 of them. Uh, so I'm doing pretty well. Definitely love the game. It has not gotten boring for me at all. I played it with new people all the time, but even when I play it with the same people, no two games are different. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me go ahead and do an overview of the game for people that are not familiar with it. Then we're going to come back. I'll tell you why I love it. Okay, I'm going to give you an overview of Cosmic Encounter. This is a competitive game for three to five players, unless you're playing with the expansions, in which case it can go up to eight players if you have enough of the expansions. I do not recommend playing the base game or any game of Cosmic Encounter with three players. Four should be the minimum. Five is usually best if you only have the base game. Now, the goal of this game is to have five colonies on other players' planets. These are the planets. Each player is going to have uh, choose a color and have a bunch of these starting ships and five Five planets that they're going to lay out in front of them, and you're going to put four ships on each of these planets, just spread them out as evenly as possible. And you're going to try to get at least one of your ships on five other people's planets, other players' planets. It doesn't matter if um, all of those come from the same player, so you have one, at least one ship on five of the same player's planets. As long as they're foreign colonies besides your own, and as long as they're on other people's planets, then you're going to move your little tracker here up on this scoreboard from zero to five, 
and as soon as someone gets to five, they immediately win the game. Now, the nature of the game is such that multiple players can win the game at the same time. In fact, it's possible for all but one player to win the game, although I personally haven't seen that happen. I know that it's possible, but we'll get into how that can actually happen as we go along. Now, uh, for right now, I'm just going to give you just the overview of how the basic game plays before we go into all the other crazy stuff that you've probably heard about this. So like I said, everyone starts with a different color in their planets, and you're also going to get eight cards from the encounter deck, which we'll get to in a second. The easiest way to tell you how to play the game is by going through the different phases. First you go through the start turn phases, then you have the regroup phase. Now the regroup phase is when you get to take a ship back from the warp. During the course of the game you're going to have ships destroyed and they're going to end up here on the scoreboard which is also called the warp. At this point at the start of the encounter you're going to be able to take one of these ships back from the warp. Then you go into the destiny phase. Now the destiny phase is, uh, this is also how you're gonna determine who the start player is. In this deck, there are cards representing each of the different player colors. So most of them, or all of them, are going to look like this, where they'll have your color, and they'll say that you can have an encounter with the player whose color this corresponds to in their home system. So when that happens, you're going to take the warp gate here, and you're gonna point it at that colored player's system on one of their planets. This is why it's helpful to spread out your uh, ships as evenly as possible because more ships is better when it comes to defending one of your planets. Therefore, uh, your opponent's always going to try to target the one that has the fewest ships. Now, there's a couple other things that can happen because of the Destiny deck. First is that you might draw your own color from the deck. If you draw your own color from the deck, you have the option of either redrawing until you redraw another color that's not your own color, or you can choose to have an encounter with someone who has set up a colony in your system in which case even if there are multiple players who have colonies in your system you target that planet and target one of those players and the the, the only purpose of this is that uh, when someone gets a colony on your planet most likely they're also they've also destroyed all of your ships there so you've lost control of this planet and if you lose control of three planets you lose control of your alien power which we're gonna get to later so you'll want to try to repopulate your one of your planets that you've lost with your own ship so that you get it back, but also destroying someone else's foreign colony will knock them back on the colony track, so that's never a bad thing. Uh, there's also some other special cards. For instance, the wild card just says that you can have an encounter with anyone that you choose in their own system. Uh, there's special cards like have an encounter with the player who has the most foreign colonies or have an encounter with the player who has the fewest ships in the warp and ties will break to your left. But assuming that you're just having a quote-unquote normal encounter where you draw someone else's color, like let's say that the blue color was drawn, so someone has to have an encounter with me, then the next phase that comes up is the launch. At this point, the player who's having an encounter with me can launch anywhere from one to four ships. They always have to launch at least one, but unless they have a special power, it can only be a max of four. So they'll go ahead and put them on the jump gates, indicating how many they're launching. Now comes the alliance phase, and this is where a lot of the fun of the game comes in, because starting with the, the offense, uh, both players are considered the main player, the person who's actually uh, attacking is called the offense. The offensive player has the option of asking everyone else that's in the game that's not a main player right now for help. They can ask everyone else for help, they can ask certain people for help, or they can ask no one for help. It's totally their choice. After the offense has asked, then the, def the defense has the option of asking as well. And again, they can ask all the same people for help if they want that the offense asked, or nobody, or specific people. It's their option. Then, starting from the left of the offensive player, those people make a decision in player order. So, one player could go ahead and decide, well, I'm going to go ahead and help the offense. So, the purple player, same thing, commits anywhere from one to four ships onto the offense. But, the green player might say, well, def uh, the defense asked me, and I'm going to go ahead and ask them. So, they'll put them over here on the defensive side, anywhere from one to four ships. And the players that were asked do not are not required to help either side that asked them. So Red can say, you know what, I'm sitting out of this one. I don't like the looks of this. I'm not going to help anybody. Now, why would you want to help either side? Well, if you're the offense, if you're helping the offense and your side wins, then well, together with the main player, you're going to be able to put your ships on this planet. And therefore, you're going to go up on the colony track and put you one step closer to victory. But if you help the, the defense, the defensive player is not going to get anything special for having uh, successfully defended their planet. They just defended their planet. Great. 
But the, any player that allied with them and helped them in order to defend their planet is going to get to draw an amount of cards from the encounter deck equal to the number of ships they committed to the defensive side. And this is important because it can be kind of difficult to get encounter cards. You start the game with eight encounter cards, but you only redraw when you have, uh, or cards from the encounter deck, but you only redraw when you don't have any of the red and green main encounter cards left in your hand. So, And also, you might want to keep some special cards that you have because when you do not have any special uh, regular encounter cards left, you have to dump your hand, which means you might lose some really powerful special cards. So it's always a good thing to get more cards, and if you really need them, you might want to help the defense. But let's proceed to planning. Once alliances have been formed, it's the planning phase. Now I mentioned that everyone gets eight encounter cards at the beginning of the game. Most of those cards, this is the deck here, most of those cards are either red or green bordered cards signifying either attack or negotiation. So here's what an attack card looks like. And these come in a variety of numbers from zero up to 40. And not every number is represented within that spread. And there are some that are multiple numbers. You know, it's kind of erratic as to what cards are here. The other cards are negotiate cards with green borders. Let's talk about the attack cards first. Oh, I'm sorry, there's also, I should mention there's a morph card which can duplicate either an attack or negotiate card that's been played. But in any case, when you go into the planning phase, each player is going to take a card that has that's either a attack, negotiate, or morph, and put it face down in front of them. Now, when both players have done that, you're going to flip over simultaneously. That's called the reveal phase. So let's just go ahead and assume that this was both players put down attack cards. Of course, you don't know this ahead of time, but when you flip, all right, both players have played attack cards. Now, it's very now at this point, it's just a simple comparing numbers. You'll take the number that's on the attack card and add it to however many ships are on your side. That's your ships as the main player, plus the allied ships, and you're going to add that to the total. Whoever has the highest total is the winner, and ties go to the defense. If that happens, whoever the losing side is, all their ships get wiped out, and in this case, it was the offense that lost, so they all get sent to the warp. And then you get rewards. For the defenders, they get to draw cards from the deck. If it had been the offense that had won, then all the defensive ships get lost, and the ships that were on the offense populate that planet. All of the ships go there. You can't just send some of them. And then you move up on the colony track. Now, that's what happens if you play an attack. But what if you do a negotiate? Well, usually, if you're going to do a negotiate, you wouldn't ask for help. And in this game, you can say whatever you want out of turn order. It doesn't really matter. You can say, hey, do you want to negotiate? Oh, sure. So then when you get it comes time to actually launch ships, then you might only commit one ship because you're not looking to attack anyone. Uh, the defense can't change the amount of ships, so whatever. There's stuff like that. So you decide, all right, let's negotiate. You both say you're going to negotiate. Boom. You both play negotiate cards. At this point, you have exactly one minute in order to make a deal. A deal can include either colony for a colony, which is to say, okay, I'm going to give you one of my ships from any one of my planets and uh, put it on one of your planets, uh, and then you do the same, give me one of yours, and then boom, we both have colonies. We're going to move up on the colony track. Great. Fantastic. And or you can trade cards from your hand. You can take any number of cards of the encounter cards from your hand, slide them over to your opponent. He slides you over however many you made in the deal, and then you pick them up and they're yours. But you cannot look at them before you agree to make the trade and pass them over to each other. You can do either just cards, colony for a colony, or both. That's your option, but you can't do more than one colony because that would be silly. You could just win the game instantly that way almost. Now that's a successful negotiate. If you can't come to a deal in 60 seconds, either because just one player says, I'm not making a deal, or you can't come to an agreeable terms for both players, then the negotiation fails. Both players lose three ships of their choice from any of their planets or colonies to the warp, and then that's the end. Uh, the negotiation failed. But what happens if you play an attack card and a negotiate card? So one side plays a negotiate card, one play side plays an attack card. And like I said, you can say whatever you want in this game. So the attacking player could say, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll negotiate. Boom. Instead, I played an attack card. Now, it doesn't matter what the value of this attack card is. It could be a zero. It could be a 40. If an attack card is played and the other card that the other player played is negotiate, the attacker instantly wins and obliterates the other side's forces. Hopefully, the other side didn't have allies with them. Um, so that means 
that's an instant win for the person who played the attack card. However, the negotiating player gets compensation. In that case, however many ships they lost to the warp, they get to take that many cards randomly from the person who screwed them's hand. <laughs> to put it in a very awkward way. So there is a penalty you pay for screwing someone over that way, but it is an instant win for you if you can convince them that you were actually going to negotiate and instead you were not. Uh, but regardless of how everything happens, that you go to the resolution phase, and that's the end of the encounter. Now, if you had all of this was called an encounter. If you had a successful encounter, you have the option of having one more encounter, which means that you'll go back to the beginning to start turn, and then when you get to the destiny phase, you'll draw a new card and see who you're going to have an encounter with. But even if that one's successful, that's how what your limit is. You can only have up to two encounters on your turn, then it's going to go to the next player. Now there's a few other special cards in the encounter deck I should mention at this point. First there are reinforcement cards, which I believe go up to five. And these are cards that either the main players or the allies who have allied with them can play after cards have been revealed. So if your side is losing in a combat situation, then the side that is losing can start throwing down these reinforcement cards to add to your total until you're winning. Once you're winning again, the other side can respond by throwing down their own reinforcement cards until someone can't do it anymore and one side is clearly the winner. You also have artifacts. Artifacts are one-time use cards. You play them, you do their effect, and they go into the discard pile, and you can play them as long as they correspond to the correct phase. A lot of cards, including the alien powers and the flare cards, which we haven't gotten to yet, have these little phase markers at the bottom. That will tell you which phase you are allowed to use it in. Some of them have every phase marked, meaning you can play it whenever you want on any turn. Quash lets you kill a deal, so if negotiation, or if any players are making a negotiation successfully, you can quash the deal, nothing happens, both players lose three ships to the warp. Cards Labs lets you immediately, like an interrupt, negate someone else's card that they've just played, whether it's an artifact, a flare card, anything except for an actual encounter card. Plague is really bad. You choose a player, and that player is going to lose three ships to the warp and must discard one of each type of card from their hand. That's reinforcement, flare, encounter card, negotiate card, attack card, so on and so on. Emotion control. After encounter cards are revealed, you can treat all cards played as negotiate cards, so you force a negotiation. Cosmic Zap zaps another player's power. Uh, we have, Every player is going to have a different alien power, which we'll get to in a minute. And when you zap their power, they flip it over, and they no longer have it for the rest of the encounter. Ionic Gas, you cancel out defense or ally rewards for the encounter. Mobius Tubes, you play this at the start of your turn during the regroup phase, and every single ship that's in the warp goes back to the corresponding player's planets. That could really help you a lot, but it's also helping your uh, opponents as well. And Force Field, you can cancel any or all alliances that were just made. You choose selectively which alliances you cancel. So, Everything I just described is the basic game of Cosmic Encounter, but of course, if that was all there is, it would just be an okay game. Let's get to the good stuff. Now, I mentioned during the main overview that each player is going to have a different alien and an alien power that represents them, and the game comes with a whole stack of these alien cards. Each one of these big cards represents a different alien race, and you're going to have one as your own at the beginning of the game. Some players do a variant where you actually have two aliens, but usually our group just plays with one. How do you actually determine who gets one of these cards? Because there are quite a lot of them. Well, that's where the flare cards come in, which were another thing I mentioned during the overview. There's a whole flat, uh, stack of flare cards that come with the game, and all of these have different special powers, which I'm not going to talk about quite yet, but most importantly, at the top of the card is the name of an alien in a very, very brief one sentence, one phrase description of what that alien does. So at the beginning of the game, you're going to deal two of, you're going to shuffle up all the flare cards that come in the game and deal two out to each player. Then that player is going to go into the alien stack, which should be in alphabetical order, and pick out the two aliens that correspond to the two flare cards that were drawn out, and secretly choose one of them to be their alien for the game. Then you're going to take both flare cards that the whoever it was dealt out to you, put them in the center of the table, and those cards, up to 10 if you're playing with more than 5 players with the expansions, are going to be shuffled into the encounter deck, which means that when you deal out the encounter cards, or during the course of the game if you draw more cards, it's possible you'll actually take the flare cards into your hand. We'll get back to those in a minute and what they do. But let's look at a few of the aliens. What's important about the aliens to remember here is that everything I told you in the overview about how the game works and how everything you know corresponds to each other, how you win encounters, yada yada yada, all of that can change 
dramatically because of the alien powers. They completely break the game in very random ways. And in fact, how different aliens interact with each other can make the game completely different every time. That's part of the fun and the variability of the game. But let's just take a look at a few of them. There's a lot, so I'm only gonna cover about eight of them. Uh, the virus, the virus is one of the most powerful aliens there's always a little brief, again, one phrase description at the top of the card so that the other players can see what it is. Uh, there's also little lights on the side that go uh, green, I think, yeah, green, red, and uh, what is the other one? I think it's yellow. Yeah, green, red, and yellow. And those indicate the difficulty so uh, of the, to play the character. So a green character is pretty fairly straightforward and easy to play, uh, whereas a red one is, can be very difficult to play. Now the virus has the power to multiply. After, uh, as a main player, after you reveal an attack card in your encounter, you can use this power to multiply the number of ships they have in the encounter times the value of their card instead of adding. Your ally ships still add to the total as usual. That's extremely powerful, but here's one thing to keep in mind in this game. If an alien seems extremely powerful and unbalanced compared to the other aliens that are in play, well, just gang up on that alien. Take away his power. Cosmic zap him. Uh, make sure you never ally with him or always ally against him to keep his power in check. That's the important thing about Cosmic Encounter. Other stuff that's on this card, you've got some flavor text. Down here, this big blue bar will tell you uh, as what player you can use it as, whether as a main player, offense, defense, allies, or everything. And then it tells you whether the power is mandatory or not. In this case, it is mandatory, meaning you must use the virus's power. You don't have a choice, although usually you wouldn't want to not use it anyways. And like I mentioned before with a lot of these cards, it will tell you at the bottom, highlighted in orange, which phase you're actually able to use this in. In this case, the reveal phase, as I mentioned. Really quickly, some other aliens. You have the sorcerer. The sorcerer has the power to... Uh, Switch encounter cards with the opponent so that he or she reveals their card and you reveal your opponent's card. Um, this is an optional power as the main player. You have the healer. The healer has the option of returning, anytime anyone loses any ships to the warp, they can return those ships to the player that just lost them and take a card from the deck as compensation. This is an optional power. Uh, the healed player replaces his or her ships on any of his or her colonies. Uh, you can heal several players if you want and draw a card each time. So this is a very helpful race that doesn't seem that powerful, but it's all about becoming everyone's friend. Like, hey, I'll heal your ships and I just get a card from the deck. That's not a big deal, right? So getting more cards and building alliances with other people can be very powerful. The TikTok is one of the races that really breaks the game in that they have their own win condition. You put 10 tokens on this ship, the game comes with a lot of these little cosmic tokens which you'll use to signify a lot of different alien powers and such. And you have the power of patience. Each time any player wins an encounter as the defense or a successful deal is made between any two players, use this power to discard a token from the sheet. If there are no more tokens on the sheet, you immediately win the game. And you can still win the game via the normal method. So that can be very powerful, but it's going to be tough for other players to let you get away with that. Uh, hate is, uh, I think, a fan favorite because I see this little avatar all over the place, including uh, the famous designer, Eric Lang. Hate has the power of rage. You can use this power to force every player to either discard a card or lose ships. Uh, first, choose and discard a card from your hand. Uh, every other player then chooses either to discard a card of the same type or else lose three ships of your choice to the warp. Uh, so that can be very powerful. There's some other stuff here. I'm just kind of trying to rush through these. <laughs> One of my favorites, the loser. You have the power of upset. As a main player, before encounter cards are selected, you may use this power to declare an upset. Once an upset has been declared, both main players must play attack cards if possible. Then after cards are revealed, the winning side loses and the losing side wins. This occurs after all other game effects are resolved, such as the human's power being zapped. Did I just say human? Well, let's take a look. Yes, there is a human, who is, of course, mostly harmless. <laughs> you have the power of humanity. As a main player or ally, after encounter cards are revealed, you use this power to add four to your side's total. If this power is zapped, however, your side automatically wins the encounter. And finally, and I'm saving this one for last because there's a bit of a funky thing about it, is the filch. You have the power of theft. As a main player, after encounter cards are discarded at the end of the encounter, you may use this power to retrieve your opponent's card from the discard pile and add it to your hand. And that kind of leads into the last thing I want to talk about regarding the aliens, and that is the flare cards. Now, the flare cards, like I said, they represent the aliens and they'll be shuffled into the deck. When you draw, actually have them in your hand during the course of the game, you may use one flare card per encounter. So if you have two encounters on your turn, that means you can use uh, another flare card at the next encounter, but you're limited to one 
per encounter. And most of the time, these cards actually, after you use them, will go immediately back to your hand. So they're, you can use them multiple times unless someone zaps it, in which case it goes to the discard pile. Now, this card is broken down into two halves. If you are not the alien that is named at the top of the flare card, you have to use the wild section of the card. But if you are the alien that's mentioned at the top, and remember, these are all getting shuffled into the deck, so there's a good chance you'll see it at some point, then you must use the super side. You do not have the option of the two. Even if you are the alien, you have to use the super. And these are just, there's a, just like with the aliens themselves, all of these cards do different things. A lot of them, especially the super side, will enhance the power that you already have. There's just a wide variety of things. So for instance, um, as a main player with the virus, if you're, if you're not the virus, you can multiply the number of ships you have in the encounter by the number of ships allied with you instead of adding them. If it's the super side, if you are the virus, you can multiply the total of all ships on your side by your attack card when using your power, not just your own ships. So that can be very powerful. Um, the healer, uh, if you're not the healer, you may cause any cosmic zap played on you to be discarded without effect. And if you are the healer, then you, make, you can raise the fee for healing other players to one card from the deck per ship you heal. And the last one I'm gonna show you just to race through these, the Filch. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is that uh, Cobb Encounter is kind of an older game. So in the original editions of the game, the way the Filch worked was different. In the standard version of the Filch card for this edition, um, for the wild, the superpower is the same for both, but for the wild power, you can discard a negotiate card from your hand to steal any one artifact or flare as is being played. But if you play with the classic edition card, you can literally steal during the course of the game. As long as it's in your hand, um, you can take ships from the warp and put them on your colonies or take cards from the deck or discard pile, even when you're not actually entitled to them. If you get caught, you lose the ship, you lose a ship to the warp and then and any items you were trying to steal and then you have to reveal this card. But then what's really funny is that the deck and discards are placed next to you for easy access. So I think that's a it's a funny card that's definitely worth keeping in instead of the other edition because it essentially just lets you steal, it's, which is kind of fun. Uh, so that is the, the main part of the game is having these different alien powers and watching the funky ways in which they interact with the basic game. And there's one last thing I wanna show you which is a variant to the game. All right, the last thing I'm gonna show you is actually a variant that comes packed in the box that you don't have to play with, but if you just wanna add some variety to the game and a slight bit more complexity, then you have the option of using them, and those are tech cards. At the beginning of the game, if you decide to play with them, you're gonna shuffle them up and deal two out to everyone, and much like with the aliens, you're going to choose one, keep it, and put the other one into the tech discard pile. Now, tech cards will stay face down in front of you, and these represent, for the duration of the game, until they're actually researched. And these represent different uh, special abilities that you can get if you successfully research them. On this side of the card, it will tell you the name, it'll tell you the phase in which you can use a special ability listed here. And then the number here is the number of ships you have to have on this card in order to completely research the tech. During the regroup phase, you have the option of taking a ship from one of your planets or foreign colonies and putting it on the face down research card. When that number of ships reaches that number on the other side, then on your next regroup phase, you can choose instead of putting a ship on it to flip the card over and uh, put the, all the ships back on your planets and boom, you've successfully researched the tech and you get whatever special ability it is. So for instance, the Omega Missile says that once you've completed it, you can discard the tech at the start of any player's encounter to choose a planet in any system, remove that planet from the game and send all ships on it to the warp. That's really powerful, but it takes eight ships. And since you can only put one ship on it per turn, it's gonna take eight turns in order to put them, in order to complete the tech. Um, so just some other examples, and that's actually what some of these other tokens here are. Um, oh yeah, by the way, I just mentioned that these are also for a specific alien called the Grudge that has his own set of tokens, but in any event, uh, these tokens here actually correspond to specific texts. Uh, so you have for this ship here, this is the Prometheus. So if you finish researching the Prometheus, you actually have access to that token, which be you put that token on one of your colonies and it behaves as one of your other ships, except that it adds an additional plus three whenever you're involved in combat. You have the Lunar Cannon, which is this token here. You're actually going to take it and put it be, uh, between two of your home planets. If that's in play and someone, a main player or an ally, if you're a main player or an ally, you may add 10 to your side's total in any encounters targeting a world next to the lunar cannon. Each time a wild card is drawn, you can choose to move a cannon. 
And then finally, you have the Genesis Bomb. Now, the Genesis Bomb, if you do it successfully, is going to make a brand new planet, which you are immediately able to put one of your ships on or more and get another colony. So it's which is pretty cool, and it's not too expensive either. You're basically making a new planet just for you to colonize it. Um, and there's a variety of other ones as well. Those are tech cards. They're completely optional, but they could be very fun if used properly. Um, and that, in a whole, is Cosmic Encounter. You're trying to wheel and deal, get as many colonies as you can, either win by yourself, which is pretty rare, rare or make alliances and win with others while trying not to piss off the other people that you're not allying with too much. Uh, there's lots of expansions which add more players, more fun stuff, more variants like those tech cards. Just a lot of variety to be had. To be had. So let's get to my final thoughts. Now, if you were to just peel away a lot of the trappings of Cosmic Encounter and get to the core mechanic, which is the, the actual encounter phase, where you're, the planning and revealing phases, where each player that's involved in the encounter, the main players, puts down a card, flips it, reveals it, uh, does what it says, and resolves that, that in and of itself, not that great. I mean, yeah, sure, you can have some surprises and some upsets, and oh, look, I obliterated your negotiation card, and uh, oh, there's you played a, a funky artifact or a funky flare card, and things got kind of weird. But still, in and of itself, not all that interesting. It's just an okay game, not a great one. It's the two other major elements of Cosmic Encounter that make this into a fantastic game. The first one is what, I'm not sure if I'm using this term correctly, but I would call it the sort of metagame of this. And that's to say that because you can say and make any kind of promises you want in this game, it's not just about putting down a card, flipping it, and see what happens. It's getting allies to join in with you on this and hoping that your allies can do some funky stuff to the encounter. It's, you know, trying to bluff and fake out your opponent and making him think that you're putting down something that you're not. And just, there's... There's so many extra little bits of negotiation and bluffing and just manipulation and rallying for another player and getting players to turn on another player and just so many little things in this game that go above and beyond the actual components that are down there on the table that is just really interesting. And it's one of the reasons why I didn't have a good time with this game in the beginning, and that's because I wasn't prepared for what the game actually was and how to get the most enjoyment out of it. And that's a huge thing in this game. Not everyone has the mindset for this game where you have to sort of be tricky and you're always, you always have to be thinking and knowing that everything that you do and every action that you take and every promise that you keep or promise that you break is going to have an impact. You might break a promise to someone and they're never going to forgive you and they'll never ally with you again. Or, or they'll turn around and make a promise to you and break it later when you're at your lowest point. Or by making, by keeping a promise and making an alliance with someone, you're pissing off someone else at the table. All of these things have to be taken into account. So that's one thing that's just fantastic about this game. The other thing is the aliens. And this is, to put it another way, the variability of this game is just incredible. I've played this game with lots of new gamers. I've played with a lot of the same gamers. But even so, no game has ever been the same with this. Even if by random chance, now I have every expansion for this game, so I have a ton of aliens. But even if by some random chance, I end up with uh, a pair of aliens when I'm choosing in the beginning that are the same as I've played before, well, so what? Because chances are, all the other players are going to have different aliens. Aliens that I haven't even seen before because I still haven't played it enough to see every alien. And how they're going to interact with my alien could be just completely crazy and insane. I've seen players' powers cancel, effectively cancel out other players' powers, um, effectively enhance their powers or make them even more useful. I've seen incredibly powerful aliens like the virus just get decimated because everyone recognizes that he's powerful and they team up against him or they choose to ally with him and you know try to ride his coattails along to victory because he's so powerful but i've also seen very weak aliens who like the healer for instance i don't think the healer is a very powerful alien but i've won with the healer twice i've happened to pull him twice in two games and i've won because i'll just be everyone's friend oh lost some ships heal yeah come on yeah ally with me i've healed you before yeah i'll come along with you that's what you do in this game and so it's mixing together all that negotiation and trickery that I like so much with the different alien powers that you have, all of that meshes together really, really well. 
and there are other expansions i'll probably get to some of them eventually doing reviews but they all add new things to the game new cards more aliens uh more extra things like satellites and uh, extra defender reward sex things like that all those are really cool but let me tell you even if you only and they add extra players as well but even if you only have the base game you're gonna have a blast the, what I would warn you about this game, well, I already said one thing, is that this isn't going to be for everyone, because people who aren't into like the negotiation, the wheeling and dealing, as the Secret Cabal podcast likes to say, if they're not into that, that's they're probably not going to like this game, because the rest of it is not going to be enough to hold their interest. Um, it can be overwhelming at first, with all the different alien powers that you have on top of the mechanics of the game, which are relatively simple, but even all the encounter cards and the artifact cards and the flare cards can be a bit overwhelming in the vast amount of things that they can do. So that's something to watch out for as well. Also, just with the if you only have the base game and none of the expansions, only play with four or five players. This game is really not good with three it's going to be okay i'll rephrase that it'll be good for two players but what inevitably happens i've played this twice well maybe three times with three players and we we're really desperate and we really wanted to play uh <laughs> was what happens is two players gang up on one player that's what usually happens and those two players coast to victory the other player loses and has no fun whatsoever so that, I'm not going to say that happens every time. I'm sure I'm going to get tons of examples from people commenting on this who say, uh, oh, but we had played with three players and it's a great time. But in most cases, it's not going to be. Four or five, uh, not even, four is not even that great. Five players is awesome. And if you do get expansions, it, the more the merrier. And the great thing is that the game can sometimes go along depending on how alien powers interact with each other. But even with like eight players, I, I'd finish the game in two hours or less because this, and this is another thing I love about the game. You are involved on everyone's turn. Even if it is not your turn and you're not a main player, you are being asked to ally. You have the choice of allying. You have funky cards you can play from your hand. Your alien power might work on everybody's turn. You are always involved in the game. It, you never feel bored. You never, I mean, I've seen less like people looking at their phones in this game than any other game I've played because you have to pay attention if you even want to consider winning the game. And because you're always involved, it, the game, it doesn't add to the game length that much having more people. It adds a little bit, but not a lot. I've played eight player games where I, I had one turn. I was the eighth player because I, ha I happened to go last. I had one turn and then the next player won the game. So it's, you know, it doesn't add too much to it. So the more the merrier as far as I'm concerned. And you can have games where and the fact that more than one person can win at a time is a really interesting dynamic. I haven't had this happen yet, but it is theoretically possible that you could be in an eight player game and have seven players win and one player lose. Most often though, it's, you know, two or three or maybe even four players I think I saw one time. I have had the great fortune of winning by myself one time. And out of 18 games, it doesn't sound that great, but to me, it's awesome. I'm so happy I won by myself one time even. So maybe I won twice, but definitely at least once, and I was very happy about that. But I'm rambling at this point. I love this game. I really do. It uh, To me, it lives up to the hype. There's going to be people who will not be able to stand the negotiation and willing and dealing, who will not be able to stand the randomness of it, because the, the, there's a ton of randomness to the game. But if you've got the head and the mind for this, if you get into it, and if you just love crazy random alien powers, and with strategy, because there is strategy in this game, this is the game for you. It definitely lives up to the hype. I didn't even mention, this game has been around since I think like 1979, something like that, and it, which makes it one of the oldest games in my collection. But man, this is game design done right. It has definitely stood the test of time. And I'm very happy that I own it. And I can't wait to see more stuff come out for it. Because they can just keep adding more and more and more aliens. And I would be perfectly happy. Those are the kind of expansions I want to see for this game. Because that's all you need. The game itself is solid. Give me more alien powers. And that, I mean, that would just be perfect. That's Cosmic Encounter. My name is Nick. This has been Board Game Brawl. And I'm reminding you to get out there and game every day and every way. Take care.